welcome to uh, our Changing Natural World. Uh, this event is part of the Calendar Climate Fringe Week, um, which is part of the part of the run up to the COP26 conference that's going to be held later this year. Um, so for this talk, we're going to be hearing from three different organisations. Uh, we have Ian Baird from the Woodland Trust. We'll have Alison Baker from Fourth Rivers Trust. And then finally, we'll be hearing from Ellie Lawson uh, from Nature Scotland uh, at the end of the at the end of the evening. Um, each of our speakers is going to have roughly 20 minutes to talk about their sort of specialist subject. If at any time when you're you're hearing from the speakers, you have any questions, there will be time at the end um, for you to, to have your questions asked in a QA. and um, You will see on Zoom that there is a QA and a function, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. So if at any point you have any questions, just type them directly in there um, and I'll be able to see them. I will uh, be moderating the Q&A um, and asking the questions at the end. So you won't be able to interact directly with Ian or Ellie or Alison. Um, I'll sort of be the, the, the speaker who is presenting the questions that they will be answering. So if anything pops up there, um, do put it in and feel free to type in throughout the event. You don't have to wait to the very end to submit your question. Um, and it helps me if you type in questions as they arrive so that I can um, so I can see them all and curate them. So we have a nice lively Q&A at the very end of the talk. Um, finally, just a wee quick shout out to our funders. Um, Calendars Landscape is funded by the uh, National Lottery Heritage Fund, who allow us to put on all these great events and activities free of charge for everybody. So many thanks to them. Um, and without further ado, uh, I'll introduce our first speaker, who is going to be Ian Baird from the Woodland Trust. Hello there. Good evening. Perfect. Thanks, Ian, and over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> now, first of all, can I just double check that my presentation is visible? Yep, it's Everybody? visible, Ian. Yep, we are yeah, all good. Good. Okay, well, I shall crack on. And as you can see from the introductory slide, I'm a volunteer speaker. Um, I'm not a member of Woodland Trust staff. I've been volunteering for the organisation with the organisation for 13 years, uh, and I have um, yeah, I'm straddling the end of my working career, and I'm now retired. Um, I, I'm involved in a number of activities with the Woodland Trust, which include tree planting, speaking to various groups, and uh, woodland restoration work. Um, it's an it's an incredible organisation. And I'd just like to give you a little bit of background um, about the Woodland Trust, which you may or may not be aware of. The Woodland Trust has been in, ex in existence since 1972. It was started in Devon by a retired farmer called Kenneth Watkins. And Kenneth, over his career, had noticed a lot of trees disappearing in um, the southwest of England and decided um, as he was coming to retirement to start replacing some of these trees. He got together with a number of friends and after a couple of years they set up a small locally based charity which has mushroomed massively um, and is now one of the largest orga environmental organisations and it's the largest tree focused environmental organisation in the UK. Um, managing over a thousand woods, um, Woodland Trust is planting millions of trees every year. Um, the figure at the moment is 47 million in the last 49 years. And every year the Trust aims to create over 2,000 hectares of new native woodland. For those that aren't too sure about what a hectare is, it's roughly a rugby pitch size. So it's a lot of rugby pitches every year that are being planted by the Woodland Trust. And it's thanks to a massive amount of input from volunteers and um, financial backers, lots of businesses that provide support to the Woodland Trust and lots of individuals that donate money to the Woodland Trust. Um, and it's through this support from over half a million people in the United Kingdom that the Woodland Trust is able to achieve such great things with trees. Now, we all know why trees are important, but I thought it's worth just having this little slide just to kind of recap on some of the, the main points, the, um, the more important points of uh, the importance of trees. 
Um, as we probably all know, trees are good for our health and well-being. Just the pleasure of having a walk in a nice wood is uh, a healthy, um, satisfying experience. However, with the subject tonight being climate change, it's really, really important to appreciate and understand how trees effectively clean the air, the cool cities, um, big cities with trees. Um, uh, it's quite nice to be able to sort of get the shade of trees and uh, they have quite a major cooling effect and particularly very hot cities. They purify our water and they prevent soil er erosion and that is clearly it's the root systems that are very effective in helping um, with these two aspects. Um, they create natural habits, habitats for wildlife and I think it's pretty clear that without trees we wouldn't have very many birds um, in the country. Um, they provide places to play and refresh our spirits and there's, well, if you just think about um, BMX biking through trees and lots of other sporting and leisure activities that happen in well-planned woodlands, um, they're very, very uh, effective from that point of view. And finally, Without trees, our landscapes would be pretty grim, I would say. Trees, however, are under great threat. Um, climate change is a growing threat to trees, um, and there's been an ongoing threat for many years through pests and disease, infrastructure development, roads projects in particular, um, intensive agriculture, which has been a problem for probably a few hundred years or hundreds of years, um, but more recently in the last hundred years, um, overgrazing, and this is throughout the whole of the, the, the whole of the country, um, and invasive species, um, again, throughout the whole of the country. So um, trees, wherever they are in, in Britain, are impacted by all these um, uh, threats. Climate change being the subject tonight, um, this slide begins to focus on um, the major threats to the natural environment which climate change is um, bringing about. And the following few slides will give a wee bit more background, but um, as you'll probably be well aware, we're already feeling the impacts of climate change on our weather, our landscapes, the behaviour of our wildlife, and there is more to come, more than likely, I'm afraid to say. With regards to the weather, Scotland has experienced, in fact, Britain, I should say, has experienced nine of the 10 warmest years on record, and this is particularly for Scotland, since the year 2000. Um, and the future is likely to feature certainly warmer, wetter summers, milder winters, more storms, more floods and periods of drought. So things are not looking terribly optimistic for the environment at the moment. Um, there are a lot of concerns. Um, impacts on our landscape, I think everybody will be familiar with some of these. We've got soil erosion, um, farming and forestry has been impacted by the extreme weather conditions. Um, rivers are flooding, coasts are eroding, um, coastal rising tides are clearly uh, an added threat. Um, hills, some hillsides are being washed away, um, causing great um, consternation for um, transportation systems. Um, buildings are obviously being affected as well by climate change. So um, just about everything that you can think of is affected by climate change. Um, and we also have the impacts on the behaviour of our wildlife. Um, the warmer temperatures are causing peak cataphthalates. This is one example, but um, I think it's a, it's a rather um, nice example um, from the point of view that it really does highlight just a simple little change in temperatures. Um, and the impact it can have. The, um, 
the caterpillar populations are, um, are determined by the, 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 the cycle, the, the, the winter cycle, and it's coming into spring, um, caterpillars start appearing at a certain time due to the, the brought on by the weather. Um, over the last few years, it's been noticed that caterpillars have been um, appearing much earlier than previously, and even just a few days or a week earlier can cause great problems, particularly for birds. And the example here is tits, who are um, hatching their chicks at a time that they've always hatched chicks. But if the caterpillars are appearing a, a week beforehand, the food that's available for the chicks is, is not so plentiful. Um, studies have actually noticed that the hatching is now beginning to, to come forward, take place a bit sooner, um, but it's quite dramatic um, when you think of the food supply um, suddenly being out of sync with the, the birth of the next generation of um, birds. And um, this is clearly uh, an unexpected and worrying um, event. Um, on the theme of more, more can be expected, um, it's quite a dramatic image, but um, we've seen dreadful fires in different parts of the world and there's the potential, and this is um, a, a prediction from the Forestry Commission, and there's a potential um, that we could be having some quite concerning fires um, in this country as well. And um, it's just something that, again, I think we should all be conscious of and aware of and take care to try and avoid. Um, trees, as we know, are heralded as being what's nicely described here, the ultimate multitaskers in fighting climate change. Um, their carbon sinks, not just the trees themselves, but the um, the dead wood that lies around trees contains carbon, the roots contain carbon, the soils around about the trees contain carbon, and all the vegetation around about the trees contain carbon. Um, and more so in the older, more established woods. Um, however, we've got a bit of a problem when it comes to our wonderful multitaskers. We don't have many of them. Britain, and this is this is actually what got me involved in the Woodland Trust um, when I discovered that um, the country that I thought was covering trees is actually quite deficient when it comes to tree coverage. The UK has 13% tree coverage, which when I discovered this, I was shocked to realize was considerably less than the European average which is 38%. And the British position is um, 13th from the bottom of European League of All um, Countries and Tree Coverage. The Scottish average is slightly higher than the average for the whole of the United Kingdom, but it's still at 18%, very low compared with the average for the whole of Europe. And more worryingly, Within that, Scotland's native woodland, um, and this is woodland which is non-plantation, native woodland only amounts to 4%. So the Woodland Trust is, as many of you will know, is completely focused on expanding and restoring um, Scotland and Britain's native woodland. Um, within which we have what's called ancient woodland, which is generally woodland that's um, areas of woodland that have been in existence for two, three hundred years, um, which only amounts to about one and a half percent of the coverage. Um, interestingly, um, it's been established that ancient woodland and long established woodland stores 31 percent in Scotland, stores 31 percent more carbon per hectare than um, newly established woodland. So the importance of trying to um, save and retain and expand our ancient and established woodland is um, heightened by that um, increased percent of carbon that can be stored. 
Um, Scotland, interestingly, has a rainforest, which I think, again, many of you will be aware of. The West Coast has um, some of the oldest and most unique rainforests um, in Britain. And again, these are areas where there's a fantastic um, carbon storage um, capacity, which really very seriously needs to be protected. Um, so what can we do to cl tackle climate change with trees? Um, clearly, more trees is the answer, but how do we go about it? Um, the Woodland Trust has essentially three main activities. The Woodland Trust creates woodland, protects woodland and restores woodland. The creation of woodland is carried out by volunteers planting trees, as we see in the photograph here, um, on large tree planting projects. The, the Woodland Trust will um, employ contractors when there's hundreds of thousands of trees to be planted. Um, but the Woodland Trust does try and succeeds um, very, very effectively and throughout the country, um, tries to engage with the public and um, organise groups of volunteers to get involved in tree planting. And this is one of the activities that I've been participating in for a good many years now and um, thoroughly enjoy and uh, find that everybody that gets involved gets enormous satisfaction. I had a great deal of understanding and um, empathy with the whole process of um, preserving and expanding our, uh, our, our woodland heritage and uh, particularly focusing on, um, as I said, native woodland. Um, the protection aspect of the Woodland Trust is where the Woodland Trust volunteers and um, staff um, try to identify areas where woodland's being threatened by developments. And here's a, a, an example of a dreadful development that took place it's, um, it, in the south of England, and it's a massive electrical substation that was um, parachuted into a wood um, by a company that hoped that nobody would notice it, and nobody did notice until it was too late. Um, but these are the kind of things which, through the planning process, can be caught early um, and hopefully stopped. And the Woodland Trust and its volunteers um, are quite active in participating in um, um, campaigning and lobbying against development that's going to um, threaten valuable woodland. Um, the restoration element of Woodland Trust activities um, focuses on um, quite often um, taking ancient woodland and improving the quality of the ancient woodland or um, mixed woodland and um, as you can see we've got mixed woodland image here we've got native on the right with lots of open space light getting through and broadleaf trees and then you've got to the left of the picture you've got a, a plantation which quite often you'll get side by side with native woodland um, and the Woodland Trust will endeavour when it can to um, remove the plantation trees and replace them with native trees, uh, which not only looks and feels better, but improves, dramatically improves the biodiversity of the wood and also the um, carbon um, capture element. An example, and bringing this round to our local environment and um, if anybody is um, from uh, the area, well, if you, any, any of you are within easy striking distance of um, Glenfinglis, you'll be aware that it's a Woodland Trust project area. It's a, it's a large area that the Woodland Trust has been actively involved in um, improving for some 25 years. And at Glenfinglis, the Woodland Trust has done an enormous amount of um, work that fits the categories that I've just described um, in terms of expanding um, the existing woodlands. The current situation is that 1,500 hectares of new woodland have been created through planting. 45 kilometres of deer fencing has been um, installed to protect the new woodland. 
300 hectares of woodland has been created or is in the process of being created through natural regeneration. And this is the kind of ideal way of creating woodland where you just allow um, trees to self-seed, um, but is something that needs to be done in an extremely controlled manner. Um, and some of the some of the woodland which has been plantation woods that have been planted on what was ancient woodland is now being restored back to being ancient woodland by removing the plantation trees and planting broadleaf trees. In addition to which, Glenfinglas is a site where the Woodland Trust is responsible now for um, two regeneration or renewal, uh, sorry, regeneration and um, hydro sites, um, as well as a biomass heating centre. Um, and finally, at um, Glenfinglas, the Woodland Trust is involved in a pilot project, which is a pilot. It's a UK-wide pilot, but there's a strong focus in, on Glenfinglas as being one of the main pilot areas. Um, where they were collecting seeds locally and um, propagating these seeds and using the local seeds to replant the local um, roots, which is the, the best and ideal way of going about regeneration. Um, looking towards COP26, um, the Woodland Trust would be really um, keen to encourage the public to show support for trees um, and uh, sort of from a campaigning point of view, there is the Worldwide Day of Action, which takes place on the 6th of November. Um, and the Woodland Trust suggests that um, the public and um, groups that would be interested in getting involved in either doing tree planting projects or going onto social media to um, just basically express how they feel about woodland and the importance of um, trees. Um, if this could be focused some way on uh, your own personal activity on the 6th of November, um, there's various websites where you can find um, groups that are involved in various, various forms of um, campaigning um, to bring attention to the importance of um, combating climate change. So um, the Woodland Trust would encourage um, individuals to get involved in that sort of activity. Um, and the Woodland Trust is also, um, through its uh, lobbying um, process, um, trying to encourage the Scottish Government to show greater leadership in landscape scale ecosystem re restoration and uh, providing more support for nature-based solutions to climate change, which as you can clearly gather, um, uh, would benefit from the restoration of native woodland. Um, so we have a wide range of activities that the Woodland Trust focus on um, and very much with a local, local, um, local concentration um, the Woodland Trust office for Scotland is based in Perth. Their um, main office is for Scotland is in Perth. And um, we have various woods throughout Scotland where you can actually volunteer and get involved in maintaining the woods. Um, there are volunteering opportunities to speak if, um, if you're interested in getting out and um, speaking to groups. Um, and then there's uh, lots of research going on into the general health of trees. Um, we do a, a bit of ancient tree verification, which is a really interesting project where all the ancient trees in Britain are being mapped by the Woodland Trust um, and recording the life cycle of um, nature in woods um, is done. This is really popular with a lot of uh, younger volunteers. Um, and if you're into photography, the Woodland Trust has opportunities for, for um, getting involved in photography of trees and woods. Um, and 
uh, for those that would like to do a donation, um, the Woodland Trust would quite clearly be delighted to receive a bit of money to help plant more trees as well. Um, so we have quite a lot of opportunities with the Woodland Trust and um, I know that there are questions later. Um, I hope that some of the points that I've been referring to would um, possibly raise some raise some questions, and I'd be more than delighted to answer any questions um, at the end of the series of presentations. And thank you very much for listening. That's great. Uh, thank you very much, Ian. If you could uh, stop sharing your screen just now, that would be fantastic. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for that, Ian. Um, great to hear about trees. We've had a few questions come in, so that's great to, to get the ball rolling for the, uh, the Q&A later on. Um, so next we're going to hear from Alison Baker, um, who's going to be speaking to us all about rivers um, from the Fourth Rivers Trust. So I'll just pass over to Alison. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ian, for um, all that information about trees. and. Uh, you'll notice that trees also crop up uh, quite a bit in my talk as well. So I'm going to try and share my screen and hope it works. So hopefully that's now working, sorry about that. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, climate change and ri rising river temperatures. Um, and just a little bit about Fourth Rivers Trust before we start. Um, the Fourth Rivers Trust is an environmental charity and uh, we provide um, quite a lot of work with a lot of people around the whole of uh, the Fourth Catchment and the district, which includes all rivers that discharge into the Fourth Estuary and the Firth of Fourth. So that extends from Fife Ness um, right across the other end of Fife, up to Balquidda and into Loch Boyle and Loch Doyne, and then down to Torness um, and near the Scottish borders. So we have um, 13 main river systems and we work with all the communities that live along those systems to look at the wildlife and, the, and how to bring benefit to the rivers along them. We have uh, very much our um, using science to uh, evidence what we're going to do. And so part of my talk today is how we provide the evidence for um, temperature monitoring across the rivers. So if you want any more information from us, you go to our website and um, there's all, all sorts of information about the individual rivers, but also about the wildlife and the science that we do. In the context of um, the Loch Lomond and uh, Trossex National Park and in particular Calendar, there are two main river systems um, that start up in the National Park, and that's the Teeth um, subsystem and then the main Fourth River. And you can see on this map here that the one outlined in pink is the Teeth, which is also a um, SAC for lamprey and Atlantic salmon, and also the main Fourth system. Very important uh, rivers um, for our area and containing a huge amount of varied wildlife. Um, that we look after. We have been working with um, the National Park producing a new river management plan um, which covers this area and uh, again we can provide the links but on that we go into quite a lot of detail about the main pressures and the work that we can do to try and um, help the rivers um, become more resilient. And one of the chapters in that plan is about uh, water temperature. So why would we worry about water temperature in our, our rivers? Um, um, and the, one of the main reasons um, we can monitor it is that our fish species, and in particular, 
Atlantic salmon and native trout perform best when the river temperature is in the mid-teens degrees Celsius. And here you see a small um, juvenile fish and it is mainly um, at this time of their life that they are most vulnerable in our rivers. If river temperatures go up, however, um, and certainly when they get to 20 degrees C, they start to struggle. And at 23 degrees C, salmon will start to die. So in 2018, when we had a, a last very hot summer, um, it was found that 70% of rivers in Scotland experienced this kind of threshold at some point during that summer. And, it, and to do with climate change, by 2050, these temperatures may happen every other year. So obviously our, the species will become more vulnerable and salmon particularly are in crisis at the moment in terms of population to do with all sorts of issues to do with marine and also freshwater. So it's clearly beholden on us to try and do something to keep the river temperatures um, at a suitable level. So what can we do about it? Well, first of all, we need to get some uh, information and some data. And in 2019, um, as part of um, the temp National Temperature Monitoring System, we deployed a number of loggers um, around the teeth and forth, particularly in relation to locks, but also other areas. And these loggers were put into the rivers for 12 months so that we can actually have a look at the temperature um, that they produced. So 2019 wasn't a particularly hot year, um, had quite a lot of water, um, certainly wasn't as, um, as hot as it has been this year and probably not for um, 2018 either. Um, and all these loggers had to go in um, into various places and then the data collected afterwards. And we can see uh, from uh, these loggers um, that the variation of temperature it goes up quite a lot in our rivers at various times of the year. But as one might expect, in the winter they're colder and in the summer they're quite a lot hotter. And uh, on the website that I mentioned, you can see uh, if you go into there what the average yearly temperature was, and what the maximum was and what the average summer was. So this is um, from the Larig, uh, which is at the top of the teeth system, which we'll talk about a bit more later. So it's not just that um, the temperatures might get to uh, a um, uh, to an amount that would actually cause fish to actually die. Um, there is a problem to do with um, the range in which fish are most productive. So the two red lines on this graph show sort of the minimum and maximum that we would like the rivers to be at. And you can see that even in 2019, which wasn't a particularly hot year, there was quite a, a bit of time when the temperatures of the rivers were higher than we would like them to be. And although these wouldn't have actually killed juvenile fish, it does mean that they tend to eat less and um, generally more lethargic and perhaps be more prey to predation and other things that they might be vulnerable to. So it's not just um, the actual temperature, but it's also the amount of time during a year um, that the temperatures might be higher than we would like. There are also other impacts from uh, rising water temperature. Um, and um, this is Loch Venica. Um, the top left hand um, picture is what we'd normally expect Loch Venica to be throughout most of the year, which is full. And you can see on these other pictures what has happened this year, whereby one of the channels has completely dried out. The temperature in Loch Venica rose um, so high that all the fishing had to stop. And most people who know um, the, the lock at the moment is very, very low. So with the less water in Loch Venica, not only is uh, some areas drying out completely, but also the, the temperature of the water from Loch Venica will be higher as it goes into the Escobane, and that will also be causing some stress um, to, to the river system as it, as it goes down. Um, and here's just a, a few other pictures of consequences of um, these issues at Loch Venica. You'll see that um, we have a dry river channel, completely dry. So any fish that were in there um, ha have um, now died. Um, and we did actually, the Fourth Rivers Trust did have to undertake a fish rescue to remove ones that got stranded in the pools. And if you look at the little uh, temperature gauge um, at the bottom, uh, you can see that at the time when the selective fishing was done, 
the temperature were nearly up to 24 degrees. So um, very critical that any fish that were, were in there were moved as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, um, obviously climate change in our rivers isn't just about temperature. Um, we do have some other issues um, and in um, a few years ago, many of you might remember there was a large um, landslide up on the Larrig above Lot Boyle, which had a huge amount of flooding. Um, there were also problems around uh, Lot Catrin with landslides there closing the roads and causing damage to property. Um, here on the Larrig, you can see the, the extent of the um, sediment that was brought down through those landslides and down through uh, the lot systems. And this sediment also causes us a problem um, because it can cause clogging up of gravels and damage to juvenile fish um, in those areas. So what can we do? Um, well, most people now are beginning to understand that water temperatures are perhaps um, something we're going to have to live with. And certainly for anglers, there's now a, a very much a feeling that uh, if it gets too hot, they should stop fishing um, as there's too much stress on, on the fish. And throughout this year, many people will have noticed that there's been a water, water scarcity report issued by CEPA on a weekly basis with advice to water users to try and um, reduce um, the amount of, uh, of water being used, particularly in the case of agricultural irrigation but also uh, perhaps more personally, whether or not we would wash our car and all sorts of other things. And so just moving on really to what the Fourth Rivers Trust is doing. Um, you'll see here, this is a, a map, and this is a map that's been produced by Marine Scotland, which is the governmental department that covers freshwater rivers uh, together with SEPA. And this is a map that um, they have produced, and there's a map for the whole of Scotland, which actually shows areas where they think water temperatures are going to be higher. Um, and these are opportunity maps um, to try and show um, where trees particularly should be planted, but also perhaps other areas of restoration can be done to make the rivers more resilient. And it's colour coded, and you'll see here, these are the, the teeth and the force systems. Um, together with the little dots where our temperature loggers are. And using this kind of, of work, we can have a look at uh, areas which are more vulnerable and try and work with landowners and see whether we can do something um, to help the situation. So this year we are working on the River Larrig, which is uh, flows into Loch Doyne, into Loch Boyle, and then down through the Balvague into Loch Lovnig, and then down into Callander. And from the map, we can see that there are areas that have been highlighted as priority um, to have trees planted, particularly on the south sides of, of the rivers, but uh, more generally so, to try and provide a little bit more protection to the rivers uh, where there is a lack of trees currently. We've been undertaking this type of work uh, around the catchment um, more generally. Uh, here's some tree planting uh, that's been done as part of Calendars Landscape Partnership at the bottom on the Lennyburn, and then also up on the Balveig, some trees that were planted two or three years ago. And you'll see that one of the issues that we are having to combat with this is, um, as Ian referred to, is overgrazing, where we're having to put all our trees into very small pods so that uh, they are protected from deer and other livestock. But also um, we often use small pods just to help the landowners be able to move their livestock, cattle or sheep around the landscape um, so that it becomes a blended landscape and not blocks of trees. Um, the planting is all native and there is a variety of different trees that we tend to use. This year we embarked on a, a large, I think will be called a landscape scale project up on the River Larrig, um, eight kilometres of the river, um, where we've been uh, working with a landowner to install small pods of trees in very strategic areas along the river, but also um, undertaking green bank protection to help stabilisation of the banks, but also to install large woody debris uh, into the banks and into the rivers. The, the large woody debris is something that we would hope, obviously, once the trees have grown along the side would be added naturally into our rivers. But until then, we're adding it to provide um, structure to the rivers, but also to allow shading and other areas of refuge for the fish. 
So here's some pictures of the work that we're doing up on, on the Larig, where we're using um, large tree trunks uh, with the root wads into the rivers to create embankments, to create, create structure, um, to, to add variety to, to the rivers, um, to keep the rivers moving a little bit faster, which also keeps them a bit cooler, but also, as I say, to, to provide areas of refuge for fish and other animals um, throughout the catchment. This uh, project, um, which is the largest, it was funded by the Biodiversity Challenge Fund from Nature Scott for this year, uh, was funded by them and also by Loch Lomond and Trossex National Park. Uh, the majority of the river work has now been delivered and we will be planting the trees up over the winter. And hopefully we can arrange for some volunteers to come up and help us plant those and sort of come up and see the landscape change that we've managed to achieve here. Um, we're very indebted to the landowner here, um, who's worked with us for a number of years um, to create uh, the opportunities to do uh, this kind of large-scale planting in the hope that we can actually demonstrate um, real step change in a few years' time. And as part of the work, um, we're doing a lot of monitoring on invertebrates, on mammals, on fish, uh, on temperature, and all sorts of other aspects um, of, of the river. So hopefully in a few years time we'll um, see quite a bit of change um, through this landscape which I'm sure um, may also get some additional trees as the landowner is also trying to put in some larger native plantations at the same time and there will be a change um, of what this looks like and for future generations to come. So thank you very much, um, here's a picture of one of the tributaries on the Larig with a hopeful looking rainbow. What a lovely image to finish on there, Alison, that optimism with your trees, your river uh, and your rainbow. Um, that's really nice. Thank no you. problem at all. Um, so we've, we've heard about trees, we've heard about rivers um, and now we're going to pass over to Ellie um, who's going to talk about peat bogs um, and the importance of them and also what's going on at Flanders Moss. So I can hand over to Ellie. Thanks very much, Julie. Um, hi there, I'm Ellie Lawson. Um, oh, I better share my screen. <laughs> Sorry about this. There we go, hopefully you can all see that. Um, so yeah, I'm Ellie Lawson and I'm currently doing a practical placement in conservation with Nature Scott. I'm part of a small team of people that look after three nature reserves around the Stirling area, um, namely Blawhorn Moss, Loch Lomond and Flanders Moss National Nature Reserves. Um, so I'm going to be talking a, a bit about some rest, tried and tested restoration methods that we've been using on Flanders Moss. Um, so Flanders Moss is uh, the largest lowland raised bog in Britain and it's also one of the most intact raised bogs in Europe. It sits in the Karst of Stirling, which is a large flat plot of, excuse me, floodplain um, that lies to the west of Stirling. Um, and the moss sits between Thornhill, Kippen and the Port of Menteith. It's around 860 hectares in size, which is the equivalent of around about 2,200 football pitches, to put that into perspective. It's host to a variety of key bog species, including bog cranberry, um, round leaf sundew, um, most importantly, uh, sphagnum mosses. Um, so these mosses can hold over eight times their own weight in water and they drive the formation of peat, making peat bogs so valuable in our fight against climate change. So around 9,000 years ago, the course of Stirling was completely flooded by seawater, which was slowly retreating after the last ice age. As these water levels retreated, um, hollows in the landscape began holding shallow fresh water which over time began to fill with vegetation. Sphagnum mosses began to grow in the still waters and as they deteriorated, they kind of created their own highly acidic environment with very little oxygen. And so they only partially decompose. 
um, so this forms an accumulation that, that we call peat. The peat forms at a rate of just one millimetre per year. So if you can imagine one metre of peat, that's 1,000 years worth of peat formation. To give you some perspective there, um, this is a peat probe being used on Flanders moss. It's been inserted into the bog as far as possible just to see how deep the peat goes underneath the, the surface of the moss. That probe is five metres in length, so there, there is 5,000 years worth of peat below everyone's feet. And we know in some areas of Flanders moss it goes even deeper to around about seven metres. Um, like many bogs in Scotland, Flanders moss has a bit of a patchy history. It has been used for domestic peat cutting and also on a larger scale has had drainage ditches put in which has dried out the peat for stripping off and accessing the fertile soils underneath for agriculture. This has resulted in the peat bog becoming smaller and smaller over the centuries. And then even late, um, excuse me, in the 1960s, Flanders Moss was bought as a forestry plantation. Rows and rows of ditches were dug for planting conifers, most of which were planted, but some didn't even get that far due to the ground being too wet. So this is an aerial photo from 1992, and it shows the extent of which the forestry reached, including, including all those lines of ditches dug out before the operation came to a halt. And we can also see large patches of birch woodland that, that have been creeping over the bog as well. Whilst woodlands are often excellent for carbon sequestration, it is now generally accepted that woodland planting on deep peat has negative impacts on, on the release of carbon into the atmosphere. This is partly due to the need for the ditches being dug out to allow these trees to establish in such wet ground. The problem with ditches, not just for forestry operations, but large ditches were dug out to literally drain the peat bog in order for the, the land to be used for agriculture. This results in the water table lowering considerably, leading to the upper layers of the peat drying out and carbon leaking into the atmosphere. Also, ditches expose the peat to oxygen, so that results in it starting to decompose and further releasing carbon dioxide. So in the last decade or so, a variety of methods have been developed and successfully used to help restore Flanders moss. So starting with quite a large scale operation called deep trench bonding. Um, this involves special excavators coming onto the moss and digging a trench around about one and a half to, do, to two metres deep through areas that may be heavily, heavily ditched. The trench is then backfilled with compacted peat and it's packed down to form a relatively impermeable barrier to water flow beneath the surface of the moss. The results from this method slows the water flow off the bog and it raises the water table back towards the surface of the moss. The bond is formed a little higher than the surrounding moss just to help restrict water flow across the surface as well. So in the, in the late 90s, Nature Scott organised the removal of the conifer plantation. This resulted in this ridge and furrow effect, which um, with many tree stumps left, left in the moss. The ridges never get wet since they're basically sticking out of the ground. So a process called stump flipping was employed. And this is where a digger will go on to onto the moss, it picks up the stumps and literally flips them over into those furrows to essentially reprofile and level out the bog. This helps to maintain a higher water level. And this area is pretty much unrecognisable as a plantation now. The water table has risen to the surface and it has started to form lovely boggy pools which, as you can see, the sphagnum has already started to form. 
Now onto some smaller scale restoration methods, um, one of which is plastic piling damming. This is a method done by hand and is used to slow the flow of water through ditches. It basically involves hammering in individual sheets of piling which slot together neatly to, to form an impermeable barrier across the ditch. In the 90s, when the first attempt of peatland restorations were being made, um, sheets of wood and metal were used to block the ditches. Um, these days we use this recycled plastic piling, which is more robust and able to take quite a bit of pressure from flowing water. It's lightweight and easy to transport and it doesn't deteriorate over time like other materials such as, such as wood. So the plastic piling dams slow the flow of water subsequently leading to vegetation building up. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, vegetation builds up behind the dam and it eventually leads to the peat formation process starting again and the ditches filling up. This is a good method to use with a team of people such as volunteers. And it's also an effective method of stress and anger release as you're bashing in each piece of plastic piling. Obviously, it's not ideal to be using plastic every time you want to dam a ditch. So another method is to use the peat itself. Oh, sorry, there's, um, there's a nice picture of a plastic piling dam that was put in a few years ago, and you can see the sphagnum really starting to build up there. So hand dug peat, dug peat buns can be used where ditches are not overly wide or, or not too wet. The process involves a team of people, usually staff and volunteers, um, digging out the vegetation and soils out of a, se a section of ditch around one metre square. This is then backfilled in peat, with peat, um, much like the larger scale deep trench buns. Um, the peat is effectively compacted by stamping down layer upon layer until the surface height is reached, as demonstrated by Dave, the reserve manager there. <laughs> Much like the plastic piling dams, this forms a barrier to water, to water movement, thus slowing the flow of water off the moss. Off the moss, sorry. Often because you're compacting the peat down so much, you will need extra to stamp down on top to bring it up to the surface. So digging out a borrow pit allows you to gain um, this extra peat and it also it will eventually fill up with water itself and become a nice little habitat for creatures such as dragonflies. So the aim of restoring Flanders moss is to move it from being a degraded bog, which is a source of carbon entering the atmosphere, to where it becomes a healthy bog, where it's growing, peat forming, and is a sink for carbon. So we have a little comparison here from, from 1992 to 2015. So years of restoration has allowed the moss to become a huge spongy grey blob with fewer scars from the ditches and forestry and far fewer trees growing on, the dry, on any drier patches across the moss. Sphagnum and other key vegetation species are spreading, creating new habitats and allowing bog specialist species such as the northern emerald dragonfly and the large heath butterfly to spread. So how is this benefiting us? Well, as we know, as we've witnessed, we've had um, heavier rainfall in more localised places. So quite simply, the big sponge that is Flanders moss is soaking up all the rain, well, not all the rainfall. It's soaking up rainfall. It's reducing flood risk further down the Forth River and is holding back carbon being released into the atmosphere. In total, roughly 45 kilometres of ditches have been dammed on Flanders Moss and 10.5 kilometres of bonds have been put in. All this is helping to hold back the water and release it slowly, allowing the moss to be the boggy sponge that it wants to be. 
So this is actually holding back an incredible amount of water. If we think back to the 2,200 football pitches, across the whole of the moss, we've raised the water table by at least 30 centimetres. This equates to having soaked up something along the lines of 2.5 million cubic metres of water. That's a lot of carbon that's been prevented from entering the atmosphere and a significant amount of potential flood water being held back. There are simple things that we can all do to help prevent degradation of peat bogs ourselves. One of which is to go peat free in your homes and gardens. If you think about a, ba a bag of um, compost that you buy from the shops, that has come from a peat bog like Flanders moss. So if we can cut that out, it's, it's hopefully going to make a significant difference to peat bogs everywhere. Peat-free compost is easily accessible nowadays, but the easiest source is to create your own compost at home. So this is an example from one of our staff's gardens showing some healthy lettuce growing from their own home, homemade compost. So if there's anyone listening today who is involved in site condition monitoring or peatland restoration and wants to know a little bit more, We'd love to have you down at Flanders Moss and we can have a, a, a chat about anything I've spoken about today. Um, that goes for anyone interested in visiting the reserve. Um, we have a boardwalk which goes out onto the moss, so you can, you can actually go out, sit or stand <laughs> in the middle of the moss, take in the tranquility and, you know, admire all the wildlife that we have pretty much all year round on the on, on the reserve. There's also a viewing tower which allows you to get up high and look right across to the other side of the moss. We have a blog um, which we keep regularly updated with anything that we're doing on Flanders Moss and the two other reserves that we manage. And there's also links to each reserve at the side. Thanks very much for listening.